Um, okay, so next up, we have roughly half an hour for the Khmer Crown Buddhist Temple over at Ruby in Norway, and I'm going to hand it over to Robert and thank him very much for setting up the, the rest of the meeting. Thank you, Pat. I chair the Land Use Committee, and there's about five or six persons in Evergreen that are very involved with land use matters. I want to tell you a little bit about how the meeting is set up so that everyone has a common understanding. We had a large, well-attended land use meeting in June, and our District 8 City Council woman, Sylvia Arenas, and Planning Director Rosalind Huey, who are here tonight, were not able to attend. So we're very fortunate to have them tonight, and they're going to be talking about some larger picture issues in Evergreen. I originally reached out to the um, public relations persons with the temple and asked them if they could present, and they were unable to at that time, so I offered it to the group of residents uh, that have been studying this. So the aspect of the meeting pertaining to the temple, it's not a city-sanctioned meeting. It is a meeting that the District Community Roundtable is doing, and one of the things that we like to do is have early community involvement there's been no application filed. It's a listening point of view. Representatives from of the temple are here tonight, members of the temple, and they're going to be listening. What will happen is that once an application has been filed, then the city has a requirement for a community meeting, and there will be discussions about how that will occur. And right now, we're going to have Morali Papasetti, one of the members of the Ruby Norwood neighborhood, give a presentation. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Robert. Um, so, good evening, everybody. So, uh, Robert, uh, thank you very much, Pat, and uh, the eight town people for giving us this opportunity uh, to share our viewpoint on this project, as well as uh, help us understand the development process of a project like this. Uh, as it says, uh, neighbors' concerns, right? Uh, who are the neighbors? A pretty diverse group. Uh, you'll find people from all faiths, all cultures, different age groups, um, from young couples with small kids to uh, to uh, retirees and uh, uh, retirees. Uh, so uh, we have a few things in common, right? What is it that's bringing together? Or why why are all of us in uh, in Evergreen. Um, I think uh, most of us wanted to get out of the hustle and bustle of the city and uh, live in a quiet, peaceful, and safe neighborhood, uh, which would allow each one of us to pursue our different activities, whether it's cycling, walking, biking, or running, whatever it is. Um, so this is the group uh, which we are representing. So uh, this I'm presenting, uh, but uh, this has been uh, collated by at least half a dozen people. And uh, I think over the last one week or 10 days, at least there have been a dozen and a half people who have been talking to different neighbors. And I think that's showing in the number of people who have turned up for this event. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to this event. Um, so to start with, uh, let's talk about the site, right? What is the site we're talking about? Um, I have a pointer. Let's see if this works. Okay. Um, so this is at the intersection of Ruby and Norwood. I think most of them uh, know this intersection for a little bit of wrong reasons. Uh, because it's a busy intersection, there's a four-way stop sign, uh, pretty much regularly there, is, there, are, there are incidents happening. And it's a corner lot, it's about, uh, I think, around two acres, uh, two acres of land. Uh, with a old home at this corner, and it has trees spread around. Uh, there, there's a barn, old barn, which uh, uh, which I think as part of the project they'll uh, they'll uh, dismantle. And the key thing is, as I said, that there is a, it's a two-lane uh, street. Ruby is a two-lane street. Narod is also a two-lane street, but Narod is much more smaller and uh, uh, I mean, like uh, it's very narrow, right? And uh, Around the site, obviously, you see all of these buildings, right? Pretty much, you are, it's covered or it's surrounded by uh, homes, which are about 40 years old. And also, there's one uh, one structure, one house, which is, I think, about 50, 50 years old, is what uh, we know. And uh, 
this neighborhood is uh, uh, it's designated as a non-growth single family family residential. So pretty much any new development has to meet the uh, meet the uh, neighborhood character. It has to fit in. It has to be compatible. Okay, the, uh, in terms of size, shape, and pattern of the building or the construction should meet with the uh, with the rest of the neighborhood. And of course, uh, we are aware uh, that uh, religious facilities or community facilities can be built as long as it meets the um, uh, meets the character of uh, the surroundings and uh, under special uh, permit called the CUP conditional use permit. Uh, which is nothing but a list of constraints, a list of uh, rules or uh, guidelines which the organization has to follow. Uh, prior to this, uh, prior to the foundation take, uh, buying this property, uh, there was a prior owner who was proposing about uh, six, six houses, about uh, 20,000 square foot uh, houses uh, for, uh, and it was approved in 2018, obviously, it's uh, a residential neighborhood and people welcome that, no opposition or anything like that. They were completely supportive of that. Um, yeah, this is about the actual background of the site. We'll actually, uh, we'll go to the, into the uh, project. So this is uh, pre-application. So application has not been formally filed like Robert just <coughs> mentioned, um, but we are informed that they are ready to fi uh, file the application for any time soon. Uh, what are we seeing here? Uh, at the summit level, it's a two-story, two-story as in like, so there's a underground basement parking, and then on the ground level, surface level, uh, there's a footprint of about, uh, about, I think we have heard about 19,000 square feet is what we've heard. Um, and initially it was, We'll come to that. Okay, so uh, what does it comprise of? It's pretty much a wide variety of buildings uh, usage, as you see. There's a temple here, there's a community building, which is about uh, both to put together about 10,000 square feet, and uh, with collapsible doors and a 2300 square foot kitchen plus uh, services area, right? So that should give you an idea. So the, the private school is not part of the project? It's not. And uh, sorry, I just uh, forgot to mention, we'll wrap it up in like uh, quickly in 10 minutes, then we'll open it up given like a lot of people are there who want to give a chance to present. Um, yeah, there's also some uh, security officers and other residences, monks, residents, about nine monks who live on site. Uh, that's about uh, 2,700 square foot uh, building. And also there's a uh, library. And the main point is, uh, it is, uh, there's a 2300 square foot kitchen, which means uh, just, it's it's uh, it's bigger than my house, right? It's a large kitchen, large industrial size kitchen. And, uh, <coughs> yes, I think we'll go to the next slide. And as I was mentioning, it's about, uh, um, about 90 to 100 spots uh, parking garage. So as you see here, there's a ramp, as I shown in the previous slide too, there's a ramp which is uh, between homes. There is a, a private home here, there's a private home here, and there's a ramp here which is uh, which will lead uh, vehicles into the into the parking lot. It's about, uh, in total, it's about an acre of parking lot, right? It's a pretty huge project. And uh, as you see here, uh, uh, there's only one entrance to this, so uh, this is on Ruby. As you see here, uh, this is on Ruby. So people would get in from Ruby and people will get out onto Ruby. So, and Narod is here. So pretty much there's uh, people would have to come in and make a right into the into the uh, underground parking lot, or they would have to come on Ruby and make a left into the, into the parking lot, which we already know, it's a pretty busy intersection We'll talk more, right? And, and also we are talking about additional classrooms, there's offices and other things in the in the in the underground uh, underground area. Right? And uh, one thing which I'd like to acknowledge uh, Leslie Leslie and team, 
um, who are representing the foundation, uh, they did have two community meetings which were well attended. Uh, they shared a lot of information. Uh, this is some pretty much good amount of information was shared by, uh, by the foundation. Um, so I appreciate that. And but one thing, uh, what uh, what we are seeing is it's, it's this the plan is evolving, and uh, every time we provide some feedback. So we provided feedback last fall um, that it's a pretty huge footprint for uh, for a site like this, for a busy intersection like this, right? And then again, there was a meeting in uh, spring this year. Again, the, the feedback was pretty much consistent, saying that it's a large project. But what happened is last fall, it was 15,000 square feet. Then this spring, it was 17,000 square feet. And now we got this new plan, which is 19,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that way, the plan is actually growing, right? And also, we have got like, uh, information which is which is evolving us changing wherein uh, initially it was like say, uh, about uh, 50 people then again there are like say 300 weekend visitors especially when 500 visitors so that information has been changing over a period of time and also number of events if we looked up their current temple which is which is at sunset boulevard it has a long list of even, uh, events as well as holidays which are on the calendar uh, but, uh, but which was originally presented, but again, that is that has been evolving in the subsequent presentations. Okay. So, I think this gives a better idea. So, this is the 55 year old building, which is in between the plot, and these are homes here. There are homes in the back here. And this is where the driveway is, right? So obviously, as mentioned, there's a bike bike lane here. This is the bike lane which you're seeing, right? This and here uh, you're already seeing a yellow line here. So this is two way, two way Ruby uh, Ruby Avenue. So we think it's uh, definitely there are safety concerns, and of course, for a 2,300 square foot kitchen, that means thank you. So that means a uh, lot of lot of food have to be delivered, right? I mean, obviously the, the building kitchen of that size, it means it's going to be a busy kitchen. If it was only used for once or twice for large events, then they would cater, right? If they're actually building a kitchen of this size, it means it's a pretty big project. Uh, then garbage, right? Obviously, let's not forget the garbage trucks. So garbage trucks have to go down, pick up garbage, and bring it up, which means it has to be a pretty, pretty huge garage too, with a lot of clearance. And collision, circulation, so uh, obviously I think we have spoken about collision, circulation, so how, how the cars stack up, right? How the cars stack up to get into the garage from um, from Ruby Avenue uh, coming from Narod or Ruby Avenue coming from, uh, from Thali, how they stack up and enter without hindering, uh, hindering the regular traffic. And last but not least, uh, noise and emissions, right? Um, Obviously, this many number of cars uh, on it every weekend, and also the hours of operations are in the morning. They have raised in the morning and the evening, so that will also uh, uh, that will also lead to a um, lot of noise emission traffic, which will definitely interrupt uh, interrupt uh, the normal life. And just one point is, see, we did look for any kind of, has there been any such projects in San Jose City? We have not seen, right? This is, this is a uh, probably first of its kind. It will set some kind of a precedent saying that a project of this kind of urban form can be built where you have an underground parking garage and a high intensity building uh, in a residential neighborhood. So that will set a precedence for a lot more things coming. And yes, I mean, like, you know, we have not seen it in Willow Glen, we have not seen it in Almaden. Why should we see it in East San Jose? So I think, uh, don't want to spend too much time, uh, but 
we have seen this uh, regular occurrence, right? Uh, there are uh, accidents happening during midday, right? Where there's no, it's not a night time, it's not a, uh, there's no rain or anything like that. Pretty much clear days, accidents are happening at the intersection. So thinking about a project where we'll have weekend hundreds of cars, it's 100 parking lot, 100 uh, car parking lot, but any number of cars could come in and park during the day, right? It's a pretty sizable project. And obviously, uh, there's a lot of high usage of pedestrians and like kind of kids biking, kids walking, kids running, right? So that's one of the key concerns what we have <coughs> at this intersection. <coughs> Uh, so I just have two or three more minutes, so we need to wrap it up. Uh, one is, as I think, just, just summarizing the uh, end of presentation. So obviously this does not confirm the neighbor pattern, right? Uh, second is, if it was, if, uh, because of the underground parking garage, it is leading to an urban form kind of a usage. It's more conducive for, for, um, um, for more of a um, area where there's uh, where there's like close to freeways and like kind of which is much more com much more uh, or a city uh, where they're able to where it is okay to build a underground parking garage but not for not for a uh, suburb or not for evergreen at least this intersection. Um, one thing is yes, uh, of course uh, the CUP comes with a set of guidelines, but I'm sure none of us want to be compliance monitors, right? None of us should always keep saying, uh, seeing these kind of, any kind of violations, calling uh, calling the departments. I don't think we want to get into that. I mean, a project, especially a temple project, should be pretty peaceful, right? The, the whole purpose of creating a temple is for, for different reasons. So, okay. Um, third is, uh, this, this is a big point, so as uh, we are showing the other slide with picture, the, that site itself has a gradient, so the houses on this sweet leaf, they are at a much higher elevation. So digging out an acre of, of uh, dirt and clearing it out could, could lead to, I think just common sense says that it could lead to uh, impacting the structures around it. Right. Even now, I stay in the in the vicinity of the of the site. Even now, my retaining walls are stretching or breaking every year. Right. So my home is forty years old. So I, so digging a hole, which is like say a acre of parking garage, it's an acre of parking garage, but they have to dig much bigger hole. Right. So that could impact the uh, the stability of the uh, area, and obviously it will impact the. Uh, neighbors who are in that area, right? Think about in that narrow street of Nauru Avenue. Think about uh, streets around that, right? Like Sepino Court, Ruby Court, all of these things. Definitely, I think, uh, given that cars would line up on Ruby from either sides, it's going to be very difficult for people to get out and get in. Yes, car stacking we spoke about. And also, we, we were informed that the project itself is about two and a half, two and a half years, years, because it's a pretty big project, right? Uh, so two and a half years of, uh, think about uh, pile driving to dig out dirt of an acre, acre of dirt, right? Pile driving every, I'm sure that itself is like, say, going to be a couple of months and taking out all the dirt and moving out. There's going to be big trucks and to move out the dirt and obviously bring, bring back all the material that is required to build a big temple like this. Right, and uh, this is just construction, right? After that, on a day-to-day -day basis, as you can see, it's going to be pretty impactful. And of course, uh, we have spoken to several planning staff from the city. They also concur that a project of like this is more of an urban form. Uh, it's better suited for uh, for a high traffic area. Or there are places, right, or within, in case uh, the foundation fell, that this zip code is the right place. Within, I mean, we just did a quick search and there are about four, four sites which, which, are in the, uh, which are in the vicinity, less than two miles, which are 12 acres, 16 acres, 20 acres, which are fantastic sites, right, on top of the hill. They can, they can build for next how many ever years, right, and without disturbing anybody there or 
minimal, minimal impact. So, last point, uh, a request to the planning commission of the city is, can we, can we uh, inform neighbors who are outside the 500 feet, because when we went door to door, there are a lot of people who are hearing about this project for the first time, and they were like pretty surprised that such a big project is happening in, in, in that intersection. So can we increase it to 1,000 feet? That's number uh, one question. Second is, of course, the city also has been very supportive, providing a lot of information. But, uh, and given that the application that we filed, and all of us, are, several of us are going through this process of we are learning, we would appreciate it if they can continue to uh, help us navigate this through this process. Last call out for the neighbors is, uh, of course, as we mentioned, only neighbors within the 500 feet are in bond. Rest of them, they, they're outside that, outside that range. So if you want to be uh, updated of any of these updates, if you want to get regular updates, probably we'll be thinking of setting an update every two weeks or every month. So if you want to be informed, please send us an email. And of course, several of us are here. There's a table outside with Tom. So please sign up so that we can send you regular updates and then we can stay connected. Um, would like to wrap it up now, at least the presentation part of it. We can open up for the training. Sure. Uh, do we have the foundation who, I want to see their attitude or their concern or what they have, because they've been getting feedback. And I feel, I, I sense that the room is all agreeing with what your concerns are, and me too. I would like to hear from their side, so what are their feedback, seeing all these concerns, are they still adamant to have the central here? Uh, it's just that they are in the room, but uh, as Robert was saying, I don't know, Robert, if you want to uh, like open it up for the foundation to respond, or will there be a separate meeting where they would present? Uh, their plan and then uh, answer any questions. How do you want to do this? I think that if uh, residents would like to hear from the um, Temple and Leslie Gardino, where are you, Leslie? That we can do that. Uh, we have time limitations, but it may be very useful if you would like to hear from Leslie. Leslie, come on up if you'd like to. Also, I want to, uh, Marali. I just want to make clear that this is way early in the planning process and the planning staff has not made any recommendations. Leslie and her team, uh, based on what the temple wants to do with the relationship with the community, has far exceeded what the city requires. They did is a pre-application which gave the planning department an opportunity to respond to what they saw so far. And that is really what we should be looking at in terms of the dialogue because planning is going to be looking at the city general plan and the policies and looking at the data and fine tuning their thoughts on what's most appropriate. We do want to allow some time for questions, but uh, here's Leslie Gardino. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. So Robert told me specifically that we were not speaking tonight. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, go off the cuff a little bit. Um, so first I want to thank everyone for being here and um, let you know that we appreciated everyone that has come to the two community meetings and there will be more um, opportunities as well for input. Um, so a couple things that we have heard and that we have built into the design, and, um, and you got a lot of it right. Great job on, on putting uh, this presentation together. So one thing that we heard uh, loud and clear from the neighbors was um, the, the, the height of the buildings. They wanted to have a low profile because the beautiful hills that you could see around the neighborhood. So we worked very hard to ensure that all of the buildings, um, you mentioned they were two story, but they're actually all one story buildings um, because we wanted to kind of make sure that we were low profile and could still see the hills and the neighborhood and not have any privacy issues for the people behind. So that um, that took a lot of effort from the architect's standpoint to make sure that all those buildings were one story. So that's uh, one thing we heard loud and clear. We sharpened our pencils and went back and did that. Um, it's correct there will be eight monks that live on the site um, and um, we have committed to even though with the CUP, um, we also heard loud and clear, um, we don't want a lot of big events, and we completely understand that. So um, in our operations plan, um, and make sure I've got this correct, um, um, we, we have, we're not, like many institutions, um, anyone that goes to, to a church, 
um, usually goes to weddings or private functions. Um, we've committed to not doing any weddings or private functions at this event. We're not leasing it out or renting it out. It's, so, it's only for this very small um, group of uh, followers to the temple. Um, so currently there are about, um, folks have mentioned um, concern about uh, size of the, of the group. Um, so it's a very small um, group of followers to this community. And um, if you're not familiar with um, the Khmer Krom, um, this is a group of refugees that came here. Um, they were allies to the Americans in Lower Cambodia, but they couldn't go to, back to Vietnam because they were ostracized by the, the Vietnamese and they couldn't stay because there was a massacre of their people and, um, by the Khmer Rouge, so they immigrated after many years here. So it's a, it's a very small community that has about 90 followers now, but about, like most churches, not everybody goes to church on Sunday, so it's about 40 or 50 folks that show up um, on a Sunday or on the weekend. So um, it's, there will not be, uh, if you let me finish. So, uh, we anticipate, and we would put in our in our CUP about four larger events per year. Um, so that's uh, not every weekend, and, and um, no private events because we heard loud and clear that you don't want to see a lot of that. Um, but it is their religion, and they do um, have a right to practice it. So as you mentioned, it's um, we do get a CUP. We go through a CUP process. Um, so we will be going through that process designated by the city, and there's also a federal law that protects religion and, and practice of religion. So there's a federal layer of protection to this process that we are able to, um, to enjoy as a diverse community of, of followers. A um, couple of other things. Um, on the underground parking. So um, that's a, that is a, there's great feedback that we're getting from folks. And let me just give you a little bit of background on where we came up with the, the underground parking. Um, there's, uh, we, we watched um, a lot of other communities of faith struggle with parking and overflow parking in neighborhoods. And we want to be good neighbors. So that's why um, we have had these two community meetings. We don't want to overflow in your neighborhood. We don't want to park in front of your house. So the idea was um, that to build this parking underground to keep the parking on site and away from the community so we would not be disturbing. Um, and that also enables us to keep the building small. So if we did low, low profile. So if we did um, eliminate the underground parking, and that's certainly feedback we can take back, then the buildings would be larger because we'd still want to have the temple space and the space for the monks to live. So those are the trade-offs, and, and we felt that as community, uh, and, and that's a big cost, I don't know if anyone's ever done development, but underground parking is very, very expensive to put in, but it preserves, you don't see a sea of cars, you see, a, you see trees and, and water, and, and more, you have more open space on the land when the parking is hidden. So uh, that, was, that was our attempt um, to, to hear that, but you know, we're happy to take this feedback back and, um, and look at that if, if people would prefer to have you know, a lot more asphalt and higher buildings. We are allowed to do that. We can go up to, sit, um, to two stories. But we just felt like looking at the, the character of the community and hearing people's feedback on that, it's always trade-offs. Um, but, but do know that you know, this is, uh, we are trying to listen. This is a, a community that wants to be a good neighbor, and that's why we're here, and that's why we're listening tonight. Um, and that's why we've had the community meetings. We'll continue to reach out and um, stay in touch and um, be happy to make sure that Robert has our information and can forward it to everyone in the room. And we're happy to do individual meetings with you. Um, whatever you would like to do, we're, we're very open um, through this process. Thank you, Leslie. We have time for some questions. So speak up and uh, so we can all hear your question. So we heard that uh, you do not expect big function. Uh, do not expect to send give up for wedding or other rentals, and you expect a small community to meet for religious purpose. So, what's the purpose of such a big kitchen? Yeah. 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 Can I? Well, I'm going to turn it over to our architects who have helped design the kitchen with the uh, the monks and the community in, in, in mind. The the goal of the, the size of the kitchen and the size of the community room is really for the functions of the community itself. And so that at those events where there are the four events during the year, uh, 
um, the goal is to have that kitchen available for those things. And so as you said, it's like, it is, it is really for that community itself. It is not for the larger community outside of that. Um, and that's You didn't hear them? I'll repeat that, I apologize. Um, so the, the goal of the, the kitchen, the, the reason the kitchen was designed at the scale that it is, um, is, is really for the community itself. And as Leslie noted, that, that the activities that happen are for the Khmer Klong um, um, population that is here. And there will be um, events that are part of the religious um, ceremonies and holidays um, and cultural events that are specific for the community. Thank you. All right, other question here, sir? Uh, so, I'm just one curious why you guys felt this was the appropriate place to put this gigantic project right in the middle of a tiny plot of land. Uh, when you yeah. said there's like 10 other places within a few mile radius. Uh, the location is within the, 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 the Khmer population that is here, that is part of this community. This is really the thing I said. Uh, if I can um, just take a stab at that. So we um, we actually have a scatter plot map of where every member of the, of the community lives, and they um, most, about 80%, maybe 90%, live within five miles of the site. So they are your neighbors. They do live here in Evergreen. They're right here in the back of the room. And uh, so they live, they live um, in this area. So that's that was one reason. Um, and in terms of the square footage, um, any project um, evolves as you work on it. Um, so um, as we got feedback, just to give you a little bit of um, you know, sausage baking, if you will, um, we got feedback back from the city um, on, in terms of uh, very specifically designing from the pre-application to the full application. You have to have um, various uh, utility rooms and, and spaces for all different things. So some of the, the square footage changes that you saw came not from the change of the size of the temple or the change of the size of the eight months residence, but from some of those very specific sort of technical rooms. So um, we didn't really, there's no changing that. If this was single family homes, it would be about, um, as you said, about 20,000 square feet, and we're proposing about 19,000 square feet. So it's well within the um, square footage allowed for that site in this area. So the sites which I suggested on Chicago are within the two months of the actual site. So it's not about in a different zip code or different city, it's in the same zip code. Mm -hmm. And now coming to... Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, there were six houses which were proposed down here. So 16 to four, probably 24 uh, family of 24 people, maybe 18 cars. That would, would have been the size of the footprint. But now, as we are seeing, this project is nowhere Compatible to that project. So the the main point that uh, we are concerned here is that the safety and the traffic is is not about the uh, building. This building is after, but so far, yeah, so far you don't have any answer for that. Thank you. So um, we, the city will does require um, a traffic study. So um, we will be um, party participating in that, and they will be doing an independent traffic study. The developer always pays for that, but the city does that uh, on its own, and the, and then we will um, see what the traffic study says. So we don't know the results of that yet, but they will be counting cars, and they'll um, they'll they'll share with us the results of that traffic study, and we will certainly share that with you. We have hit our 30 minutes on the temple, and we are going to have more community meetings. We're going to have them back. We have um, an hour left, and we're going to start the presentation. I want, I want, I want to talk. Okay, let's move on. We're, we're going to move on at this point. So the next segment of the discussion is land use issues in Evergreen. And tonight we have our District 8 Council member, Sylvia Arenas who is present, who could not attend in June. And we have Planning Director Roslyn Huey, who is actually the Director of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. How things like this go through a process where the community gets involved and gets to provide their input. The next two 
people are good people to listen to because they're running that process and in charge of it. So if you have process questions, you probably write those. Well, good evening. Again, my name is Rosalind Huey. I am the director of the Department of Planning, Building, and Code Enforcement. Uh, it's good to be with you this evening. I've uh, attended meetings in the past, and um, I'm actually happy to be your neighbor. I live just on the other side of a board, so I'm a proud District 8 resident as well. Um, my apologies because I, I did not bring my own laptop, so I'm not able to project. I just had a few slides that I wanted to share. Uh, Robert Reeves is actually passing out some hard copies um, of the slides, but it's just, uh, I can definitely just walk through the information. So Robert um, asked me um, to prepare information on some very broad, um, not only just land use planning items, but other items that our department is working on. And so the first one that I wanted to share with you that I'm sure many of you are going to be interested in um, is uh, the four-year review of our general plan. And uh, many of you are probably familiar with our general plan. Every city in the state of California is required to have a general plan. And what that document is really is the blueprint for the city for how it's going to grow and develop over the long term. So our current general plan uh, plans for growth and development to 2040. Um, and within that document, we're actually planning to grow um, by over 470,000 residents. So you know the Bay Area, the city of San Jose, we're attracting a lot of people. We'll continue to do that. Our population projections indicate that we'll continue to grow in population. Uh, and then we also have an aspirational goal to add um, over 300,000 jobs um, in the city as well. So um, our work in that, again, it's for the long term. It's um, planning smart for the city uh, to be able to accommodate uh, the growth in both population um, and in jobs. So the general plan itself actually calls for the city to evaluate how it's implementing the general plan. So our current plan was adopted by the city council in 2011. And the document actually requires every four years we should do an evaluation, we should do an assessment, and decide if there are any new policies that need to be added, if there are policies that need to be modified, or if there are any course corrections um, that need to be made. So we actually undertook our first four-year review uh, back in 2015 and 2016. We ended in 2016. So we're now starting our second four-year review this fall, uh, and it will conclude uh, next year in 2020. Uh, we took our scope of work for this uh, four-year review to the City Council for approval, and it was approved um, in June of this year. Um, our scope of work is very specific. We're not looking at changing the whole document or adding new sections or uh, coming up with brand new policies, but more deciding what things need to be modified or adjusted. So some of the key items in our scope of work include um, looking at uh, the land use policies uh, for no North Coyote Valley. Uh, many of you may be aware that the city is actually in negotiation of purchasing land uh, in the North Coyote area uh, for preservation. Uh, and so with that, the, the current land use plan for that area actually calls for those lands to have jobs on them. So in this year's four-year review, we're going to be looking at uh, if the city does actually go forward with the purchase, and it looks like we are, uh, about changing land use designations and re reallocating those jobs to different parts of the city. Obviously, we know that housing in the city is a key, key priority, uh, both affordable housing and dealing with our homelessness issue. And so housing opportunity is a key uh, scope of work uh, for this four-year review. We're going to be looking at just a variety of um, housing policies to actually continue to facilitate housing production. Uh, we all know that we need to continue to add more homes to the city. 
And at the same time, we also need to protect uh, the residents and the homes that they have. So residents who are currently in affordable housing to make sure they're protected. Uh, and then we wanna make sure that we're preserving our affordable housing stock. So we're gonna be looking at policies and strategies uh, around um, housing. Uh, along with that, we're going to be looking at um, introducing um, housing and underutilized business corridors. Um, these are areas generally well-established business corridors throughout the city, uh, probably about six or eight or so that we're going to be looking at and seeing if there's opportunity, if there's underutilized land or vacant lands in these areas that might be well suited for new housing and particularly affordable housing. Um, we're going to be looking at our urban village strategy. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, the urban village strategy is a key component of our general plan. These are areas in the city where we have decided that um, a significant part of the new uh, growth will happen. So these are areas we have 68 urban villages across the city. Um, and we have struggled actually in seeing new development happening uh, in those areas. So we're going to be looking at policies to actually facilitate new development in those areas. Um, and then lastly, and I know this is going to be very, uh, uh, you'll be very interested in this, uh, uh, a major part um, of our scope of work for the four-year review will actually be looking at the Evergreen East Hills development policy. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the current uh, development policy that covers um, the Evergreen area. It actually goes into a small portion of actually District 5, and I think actually a little portion of District 2 um, as well. So it's got a really big boundary. Um, this development policy has been in place since 2008. Um, and we're at the end of actually retiring the policy. So when I say that, um, most of the development capacity uh, that was approved in that area development policy has pretty much been met. Um, and so uh, the policy actually required um, developers and applicants to pay uh, transportation impact fees in order to accommodate the new development. So we're really at the end of the capacity um, it's less than 200 homes uh, uh, that we have remaining capacity for, and less than about 70,000 square feet of non-residential non uses that we have left uh, in that development policy. So during this four-year review process, we want to take a look at the policy. Um, should we be retiring it, closing it out? Um, is the need for a new policy? So we'll be uh, taking a very close look at that. And I know that many of you are going to be following that. Um, the four-year review process, we have a task force that's being reconvened. Uh, it's a 42-member task force uh, that's been appointed by the mayor and council, um, representatives of a number of different neighborhood organizations, special interest groups, um, and each council member um, has a representative um, that they have selected to represent their district. So the process actually starts our first task force meeting and all of the task force meetings are open to the public. Uh, our first meeting is going to be held uh, in November. We have six meetings. We'll be concluding the task force uh, process in April and then we'll be completing the environmental review process and then bringing um, the task force recommendations to the city council for their consideration by the end of next year. So that's the four-year review process. Um, one other item that uh, I wanted to make sure that you all are aware, you've probably heard a lot about accessory dwelling units, um, also known as ADUs or granny units or second units. Um, the, again, uh, the mayor and council has made this, um, the ADU program, uh, one of their key priority items and has directed our department and we have other partner uh, departments mm -hmm. that we're working with to really facilitate um, how we can get more ADUs built um, throughout the city. Uh, we really believe this is a way to actually add affordable housing 
uh, to the city's inventory, and it's done in a way that it's definitely at a, a much lower scale than, say, for example, a six-story building uh, in a neighborhood that at this point hasn't seen that scale of development. So we see it as a way of um, bringing in um, more density uh, to our areas and providing uh, affordable, the much needed affordable housing for our residents. So a couple of key things, um, our department, we've actually um, created a position and put someone in it to actually serve as an ally. So we have a ADU ally and this person's role is to really uh, answer questions of homeowners. We know that homeowners aren't developers and, and homeowners aren't used to doing major, uh, any projects really, I, I think building their own uh, structures on their lots. So we have this person who's available to answer questions, got you through the permitting process. Um, we've established um, a day um, at our permit center on the first floor of City Hall. Um, on Tuesdays, we call it ADU Tuesdays, where our staff are focused on processing ADU permits. Um, on that particular day, all of the express appointments are dedicated to our ADU customers. So our ADU customers are getting special treatment on that day. We also have a special intake line if you want to just come in and, and submit um, your permits for an ADU. Uh, the key thing about the express appointments, it's very exciting. So for homeowners who are, who are really ready, if um, you've gotten your plans together, you've been working with a, an, uh, an architect, you've maybe had some discussions with staff previously, and you're ready to submit your ADU permit, um, we have these 90-minute slots where we have staff from planning, building, public works, uh, and the fire department to review plans. And if everything is in order uh, and, and everything is checked off, you can actually walk out of your appointment with your permit in hand. So we're very excited about that service. And then lastly, we have uh, enhanced our AD website. So we've got a wealth of information um, for homeowners and for other customers who just need more information. We've developed um, a universal checklist, so it's a, a document where you can just go through and answer the answer questions and to determine if your lot actually does qualify for an ADU. And I'm really excited because I've seen these in our neighborhood. There, there, there's one beautiful one on Ruby. I was walking one day and I'm like, oh my God, what a lovely ADU. So we're very excited and hoping that many of our homeowners would take advantage um, of the resources that we're putting toward that. Um, lastly, um, just wanted to talk about um, so a couple of development um, activity highlights. Um, not a lot of development activity going on. I think first and foremost, we know that for the last couple of years, um, the community college with Republic Urban um, have been moving forward with their proposal for the site at the community college. Um, and we all now understand that um, the community college is, is decided to no longer move forward with uh, Republic. So in essence, um, that application uh, at this point is on hold. Uh, we haven't had further conversations with the, with the community college. We anticipate to be hearing from them to you know, hear uh, what direction they're going to be taking uh, in the future. But um, in terms of our staff's processing of that application, there's no work being done on that currently. Um, and then the other um, uh, development activity you just previously heard from, uh, the Ludus Temple proposal, which I do want to stress, um, there is not an official application on file yet with our department. They did submit a preliminary application, and uh, we're very, um, very glad when applicants decide to do that, to submit a preliminary application uh, so we can highlight, right, some of the issues or concerns. Uh, we're very glad that they're doing a lot of what we would call pre-community engagement. So they're meeting with neighbors now. Obviously, once we uh, receive an official application with them, they'll be required to um, do additional community outreach. There'll be a city-sponsored community meeting held. Um, and at that point, once we get the application, We'll go through the full analysis. I, I, I know that there are many concerns um, about traffic, perhaps about noise, even air quality. Um, and all of those issues will be considered when the project goes through its environmental um, analysis. 
So that is definitely required. We do that for every development proposal um, in the city. So um, more to come on that once we actually have an official application on file. Um, the other project that I wanted to bring up is not actually planning related, but I, I know there's been a lot of interest um, in the tenant improvements that are currently going on right now in the former Walgreens store <laughs> at the Village Square right here. Um, and you can see now the sides are up, that Dollar Tree um, is going into that space. I just wanted to clarify, so um, that was a tenant improvement project, so there were no planning uh, approvals needed. So the, the, the site has the commercial land use designation, has the correct zoning, uh, the use is allowed, and so that's why uh, the tenant can come in, do the improvements, and actually um, open up the store. So I just kind of wanted to clarify that. Um, and then lastly, um, Reed Hillview Airport. Um, I'm sure that this has been in the news, a lot of activity around that. Um, we know that the Board of Supervisors has taken action. Um, actually, the director of the Roads and Airports Department um, came to City Council back in August of this year, providing a briefing um, on, on, uh, on the activity uh, for the airport. We all do understand that um, the intent is to close that airport. Um, we know that a lot has to happen um, before we get to that point. And I think actually, are we, it's a 2031? I think that's 12 years. 12 years, okay, right. Um, so one of the actions that the Board of Supervisors did take uh, was um, to ask the uh, Roads and Airports uh, Department to consult with the city, with my office in particular, um, for any initial planning work that they're looking to do um, on the site in terms of potential uses. Um, my understanding at this point, they are not moving forward with any detailed land use planning or environmental analysis, uh, but just wanting to do some conceptual um, work on the site to see what potentially could work. Um, to this point, we haven't been contacted by the Air Force Department yet, um, but when we do, we will definitely be, and I know that we'll be working very closely with the council member uh, and with the community um, as that work evolves. Um, and so with that, that's all the, the updates that I have, and I think I can turn it over to council member Rennes. Questions? Questions? I saw her here. Yes, ma'am. Regarding the four-year review process, um, you said that there are representatives from all over the city, and every district has a representative. I'm just wondering, I actually have a question. Is it relatively equal per district, or is it like every district that gets one and the other one gets three? Uh, you know. So each council district. It's so there, there would be ten. Right, so each council member, and I'm sure the council member reading this can talk about, um, you know, how, how that works. I'm not involved in the appointment of the task force members. Yeah. I know there's 10 districts, so mm -hmm. just to set it to be equal. Yes. Uh, and then, um, how, is there going to be any opportunities for us to get our voices heard in doing that process? Because, uh, you know, this is a bedroom community and we're already very impacted. Uh, so how how can our how can our community try to keep that evergreen um, limit going or so absolutely you can be involved in the process. So a couple of ways we have um, we have developed a web page on our website. So we would go to San Jose CA .gov, um, slash planning. Um, and then click on citywide planning. That'll take you to our, our web page for the process. Um, if you uh, want to be kept um, up to date, task force meetings, well actually all the task force meetings will be listed there. As I mentioned, they're all open to the public. And during the task force meetings, there will be opportunity for members of the public to speak. So you can, you can give public comment um, at those meetings. 
Um, and obviously, I think, and I'm sure the council member would encourage you to, to work with the District 8 council person, uh, council representative, who is going to be serving on the task force, uh, to share your comments, concerns, uh, and to, to get some feedback through that process as well. But it's a total public process. We'll have an email list uh, set up, so if you want to stay involved, you can get your email address and make sure you're on the distribution list. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So I have a, pro uh, a question regarding the process. In terms of the Buddhist temple, you were saying that the application has not been filed. Once it's filed, what is the process like? What is the timing from the city point of view? How do they? Uh, how are they going to take into consideration the community feedback? And last part of the question: Is there any scenario where the city is able to say this is not the right side? The application is rejected. So to answer the first part of your question in terms of how the process will work. So we do anticipate this will be a conditional use permit application. Um, once they file that, um, one of our staff members will be assigned as the project uh, manager and that person will be your main point of contact. Uh, that project manager will be getting you know, email addresses, um, phone numbers, uh, so we can keep you up to date on the process. Just like for any other planning development application, it is the environmental review process that really is the critical path. So once we get the application, um, uh, the applicant will be, will be required to submit an initial study for the environmental review process. And that will determine what level of environmental analysis will be needed. Um, and that, again, the environmental process is the critical path. On average, um, that can take about you know nine months, depending upon the level of, of um, uh, clearance that's needed. Um, staff will do its analysis. It will be community engagement. Staff will take that input into its analysis. Um, we will be reviewing the application based upon how it conforms to our general plan and to the zoning standards. That's what we do. So um, that will be the so that will be the key part: conformance with our general plan, conformance with zoning, and determining um, the outcome of the environmental review process. This particular um, application type, the conditional use permit, uh, goes to our planning commission uh, for action. So they will be taking they will be the body taking action on this particular uh, permit application. But their input is about changes or it's about approving or rejecting? Um, they can approve it, they can approve it with changes or they can deny it. But and there's, there's, a, there's a analysis and a process that our staff member will go through in order to make a recommendation to the planning commission for its consideration. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here, Joel. Uh, I, I understand that you mentioned this process, and I do apologize to say this, that I have seen some processes like this at City Hall, where people who are here will not be informed, they will not be able to come, and the things just slip through their crack, and they all get approved. And I know that your process is fairly decent. I'm not denying your process. But this thing, this kind of a thing should have been rejected at a very early stage because there are a mass amount of people who disagree with the road, with the condition of the way this is, the location, and there are a lot of uh, thousands of other reasons that we can give you at the earliest stage. So city doesn't waste a lot of manpower, time, and effort, and energy, keeping these people in limbo, thinking that there are good citizens like yourself, working at city hall to protect them, but eventually things will fall through the crack. Whoever pays whoever without any insult to anybody in the city, things will happen for the benefit of those people. And I'm trying to bring this attention of people who know I've seen this happen at San Jose, and I, I just warn you to get this going at the earliest stage to process the rejection and, and do an earliest stage review so it doesn't get to the end and then somehow things go wrong for everybody here. And I just appreciate you to get participate a little bit at the earliest stage and be more proactive at least. Because people are here now 
and a year from now, the, the things get forgotten, and, and things go wrong. So again, we will do our full analysis um, once we receive um, the planning permit application. We will undertake that analysis. There'll be um, community engagement. We already know, I'm sure, Councilmember Aranis is going to be very involved. Um, and so, but at this point, we don't have the application um, to analyze yet. So the process hasn't started. And again, this particular applicant decided to do this preliminary work and to do early engagement with the community. So all of this will feed into the formal process. So right here at the top of my head, I can't give you a specific example, but I know even for in District 8, um, there, there are actually single family homes that have underground parking, um, believe it or not, but it, it does exist. So underground parking exists all across the city. And again, once we receive the development application, um, the parking issues uh, will be reviewed. Uh, they'll be analyzed. It has to go through the environmental review process. So all of that will be analyzed. That's one or two cars you're talking about. I'm talking about 100 cars. Okay. And again, the, 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 pro the project will be analyzed based on what they're proposing. Absolutely. All right. Any of these remaining questions about something other than yes, the yes, project? Yes. Go ahead. You, you just mentioned that Dollar Tree that is coming up, everything is legal and everything is So my advice to you, you would have to work with the property owner uh, to share your concerns. It's that's that's who you go to because from a land use planning regulation point of view. So basically, the opinion of the public doesn't matter at all in anything because if the landowner decides, like for the castle, for example, if the, that property is being decided who server wants to sell that property to anybody. So again, um, every land has a general plan land use designation. It has a zoning uh, that indicates what types of uses can go on those sites. So um, again, for this particular, for the Dollar Tree store, because the general plan land use designation conforms, the zoning conforms, it's another retail store going into a former ret a retail store space. Um, all they needed to do was actually to come into the city for building permits for the interior uh, tenant improvements. And again, my advice would be to talk to the property owner about who he or she leases their property to. But, but we need a, a government official that can take a concern. Uh, she's right. going to talk next, so let's let's table. We'll have time for some one second. Yeah. Oh, your arm falls off. <laughs> Mine's a really easy topic. Um, in regards to the ADU and all the updates that have been happening, Historically, they've been different for Evergreen. Um, is is it all San Jose can build an ADU if your property 
property size can accommodate that? Because from my understanding, it's been evergreen has been siloed. Absolutely not. So residential lots, uh, and the city council has actually continued to relax um, uh, the regulations for ADUs. So um, I mean, I, I can probably go on the record to say that all of these single family lots here in the evergreen neighborhoods would more than likely qualify for an ADU. And again, you can go to our checklist, you can check your zoning, you can check your lot size and the size of the ADU that you want to build. Just an additional question. Say if you're a property owner and you have been zoned for a particular like zone, but you still have land that could be used for housing, will there be anything in the four-year plan that will ease that for homeowners so that you don't have to pay the additional like uh, rules and regulations to like pursue rezoning your property? Because right now it's like you would pay an additional amount to like even be considered for rezoning, but this is for housing purposes. And if the part of the four-year plan you mentioned is to build housing opportunities, there needs to be something that like makes it easier for the for the homeowner to, to pursue that. There's some PD zoning out here. Is it preferred for the PD folks? Not necessarily. Not necessarily for PD that zoning. Would, that would be the one. That, that would be the concern. Would be yeah. if it was PD. It is. It is. Yeah, it's and that would, that's good. the answer. So again, I, I would encourage you, and I can speak with you offline um, to get your particular concern. So if anybody wants to follow up with us, and I apologize. So my email address is really long, and my name is uh, so. The first name is Rosalyn. It's R O S A L Y N N dot Huey H U G H E Y at San Jose C A dot gov. And I have some cards I can pass out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we need to move along, so our council member has been patiently waiting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> My name is Sylvia Dennis. I'm your council member. Um, I'm really pleased to be here once again. Um, and I apologize I couldn't make the June uh, meeting. Uh, it's our budget season, and uh, we, we get down to the nitty gritty to make sure that uh, District 8 gets uh, their fair share. Um, and so but I'm, I'm here now to talk about a little bit about land use. Um, and for those of you who may not know me, I just want to share just a little bit about who I am, how long I've been living here. Um, so I'm a mom of two. My husband and I have been living here for about 17 years. And uh, if you know where the Evergreen Community Center is, that, that uh, neighborhood is called the state, um, not because it's it's stately. But everything ends at the states there. So I've been living there for about 17 years. And um, oh, a, a little girl and a, and a son, an 11 year old and a four year old. So, anyways, that's just a little bit about me. If you uh, please approach me afterwards if you have something very specific uh, that you'd like to discuss, and I'm absolutely all ears. In this room is also some of my team. This is my chief of staff, Patrick McGarity. And then back there is Nancy Lay. Um, and so you can talk to any one of them or you talk to me um, after the meeting. Okay, so when I first uh, started, we, there was a development that was, it, I was drawing some parallel similarities to when I first came on board and we were talking about the Evergreen uh, College development. How many of you have heard about the Evergreen, the 27 acres right? Okay, so we'll go. Uh, into what that entailed. Um, but when I came on board, one of the things that I learned was that our community wasn't engaged. We, we hadn't been pulled in um, right from the beginning. And so what was important to me, and it's one of the things that I'm gonna talk about, there's three things that, I, that I've learned. I said three. <laughs> there's three things. There's three things that I've learned. Um, about land use, because land use takes a great deal of our time and energy in the city of San Jose. We're growing, right? But Evergreen and District 8, we're not meant to grow. We just aren't. There is a development policy called Evergreen East Hills Development Policy, and that is really corrals the development and dictates how much development we can have. And there, there isn't very much in life. Um, Rosalind said, we're at the point where we've exhausted that amount and we need to figure out what is the next step that we're going to uh, take as a community together. So one of the things that I've learned is 
make sure that our community is engaged. The second thing is making sure that when they're, when the developers come in, they usually typically build what they're legally allowed to build, right? And we want to make sure that we hold them to that. Um, when they when they want to maybe uh, have some, and we have some discretionary um, authority over that project, I look for community benefits, right? Something that will help maybe ease the, the, the traffic. At this point, we've been mitigated out in terms of traffic. There isn't anything more that we can do in terms of traffic unless we uh, create a subway system, which I'm guessing none of you would <laughs> like. So, so we've done all we can, and that's one of the reasons why we really need to close up this Dawn's housing. So one is engagement. The other one is making sure that there's community benefit. And the last piece really was about rules. And um, rules apply to everyone. It doesn't matter if you have a lot of money. It doesn't matter uh, what it project that you're proposing. The rules are meant for everybody to follow. There are no exceptions. And we have a very strict process in terms of the planning department for them to review all of the policies that are under our general plan and for those projects to adhere to those policies. If they don't adhere, they don't allow for that project to move forward, right? Um, and the reason I bring up the rules is because last year, how many of you have heard of the Measure B and Measure C that were on the ballot last time, right? And I actually want to thank you for, for if, I think many of you here in this room helped us get that over the finish line. That is an example of how a developer wants to uh, dictate to the city on how they want, what kind of development they want. And they're going to break all the rules, um, and they're going to make a mess out of our general plan. Our general plan has had um, just a plethora of information from all of our community members across the city. and so. There was a process there, um, and it should be respected, and the outcome of, of uh, that community engagement is now uh, bound by this envisioned uh, 2040, our general plan. And so we beat that, we made sure that was measure B, and then what we did was we also included measure C, right? So that, it, that protects industrial lands from being turned into residential, which is, the Berg site over on, on the other side and, and back of uh, the college. So, so those are some of the things that, that, for me, in terms of principles, that's where I really hold um, developers to the fire, their feet to the fire, uh, to make sure that they uh, adhere to some of those things. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, out of order just to, to like, there's, there's an elephant in the room in terms of, of, of this development that was discussed earlier. And I just want to reiterate what our planning director already has said. There is no official city role because it hasn't been submitted, right? So my, my uh, staff, including my chief of staff, has attended some of those meetings um, on our own, you know, and, and uh, they've accepted for us to be there, but we play no part in that, in those meetings. That's them um, uh, engaging the community, and that's a discussion that, that they are um, wanting to have with the community before they actually submit a proposal. So once they submit a proposal, then the city has a role, and my office will have a role. Um, but until then, it is I have I have no legal role in that development. Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. As a resident, what is your opinion? <laughs> that is really unfair because I'm here as a council member. <laughs> <laughs> I'm resident. If I wasn't a resident, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to qualify as a council member. But let me just tell you this. So I, you know where I live, and you know that there's two large, huge, huge uh, churches right on San Felipe. And, you know, I also encounter some traffic issues. We have a police officer. Um, now directing tra traffic every Sunday and then some festive days and stuff like that. So I completely understand. I, I take your concerns seriously. I've no noted them down, and, and hopefully I can get a copy of that presentation. But I've written them down in, in terms of looking out for what is important to you and to be able to facilitate that conversation. 
But, and so let me get, go back to what I was drawing the parallel between the Evergreen College project and, and uh, what we are discussing now. And that is that the developer hadn't won, they hadn't connected with the community, and, and they kind of had made a, a little bit of a mess with, in terms of relationship, right? Um, so it was hard for the community to hear them because they just, they hadn't engaged them early. So, so um, what I did, I made sure, and I worked with Robert and Sandy and Wes and a lot of the other members who are part of the Land Use Committee, and I want to thank you for, for uh, making this invitation to me today. Of course, it is a round table um, as well. And so we all work together to figure out how can we stop this process? Okay, how can we put a break to it so that we can figure out what the community input is? And so we did a, uh, our version of a charrette. And the charrette is you know, this huge meeting where we get input about the different aspects of, of uh, what they were, I think at that point it wasn't a, it wasn't, it wasn't submitted at that point, uh, Rosalind, right? It was a, uh, it was a pre-application as well. So it was, it, so that, that's why I draw so, so much similarity. So it was a pre-application. And what we did, um, and what we did is we brought in um, some, of, some of our planning staff to help facilitate this conversation and really get, um, put some structure to the conversation and to the feedback. Um, so, so I think that's one of the reasons that, um, and I, I want to say that the, the land use committee is one of the goals that you all wanted, right? You wanted to be engaged and you wanted to be at the table and I made sure that that happened. Um, and, you know, we had to follow what my predecessor dictated in terms of uh, the motion that she made at the last uh, meeting of the year before she, uh, before she retired. Um, as a council member, and that was um, to have a uh, to, to to have a a plan for the 27 acres, a whole visioning plan for the whole 27 acres. Master plan. Master plan. Thank you. That's why you're in the land use committee. <laughs> and um, and then uh, th there were just some other conditions there, and so we had to follow that that direction. But within that direction, we were able to gather some input. So that's why I really value uh, the community's input. And believe me, when the, when the moment is, is right in terms of my role as a, as a council member, I will absolutely engage, in, uh, engage you into this conversation, and, and I'll play a role. Um, but I also have to uh, respect the process of the planning um, department. There's already a process. Um, remember I said I was really uh, keen about rules? I can't break them just because I'm a council member. Right? So I have to respect and follow the rules just as well in the same way that we expect our developers and folks who come in and build uh, to do that as well. So with Ever Evergreen College, um, I think Rosalind already mentioned that uh, there isn't any project on file. I mean, there isn't any project moving forward anymore. They've ended that relationship. As far as I know, I don't think they're going to pick it back up. And, um, and we'll see what, what Evergreen College um, does in terms of next steps. I think they've learned their lesson, that they need to engage the community. And actually, it's one of the things that when I met with um, one of the, chan or the chancellor, that's what I told them. I said, you know, lessons learned, engage the community. And, um, and hopefully, you know, we will continue to um, press on them the, that importance and um, absolutely follow any, any changes uh, to that submission. Um, and we'll keep you abreast of that. Um, let me see, I'm going through my, my notes. Let me talk about the Evergreen um, East Hills Development Plan just a little bit. Because that is going to be one of the changes that, that um, that I really want you to be involved in. So when the general plan update happens, and we actually, I wanted to uh, clarify, we have three members that represent uh, Evergreen. So you'll, you'll have me, because I'm assigned to the task force, and then you'll have Bonnie Mace, who's been a, a member um, here in our District 8 Roundtable uh, for a long time, and she's also served in the last update. And then we also have Jim Zito, who will represent um, the Evergreen School District. 
So you have three people. Um, most other uh, districts, I, think, I believe, have a maximum of two. You have three. And before um, anything happens, I want to make sure that I engage you. So we'll have a meeting before anything happens, so that way you can provide me with some input. Or after a meeting, if you want, we can also um, establish some sort of process so that you can um, remain um, involved, even though that maybe you can't attend some of those task force committee meetings. Um, we'll find a way to make sure that your voice is heard. Um, so that's my commitment uh, for the Evergreen East Hills Development Policy. And the reason um, why I want to uh, talk a little, uh, about this a little bit more is that I told you that, that this area is not meant to grow. We're just not a, a growth area, right? Um, and there's goods and bads about that. Um, a lot of people ask me for Trader Joe's, um, and they ask me for all kinds of amenities, but we, we're not meant to grow, right? We do want some retail, but our retail uh, folks, are, it's really hard for them to bring in retail. We brought in Sprouts and Costco over um, right across the street from, from East Ridge Mall, there's going to be a Costco business soon enough. Yeah. Um, so, so for those of you who like Costco, if not, you, you go to Sprouts. So, so the, the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because we're moving from, in this uh, Evergreen East Hills Development Plan, we're moving from one way of determining um, environmental impacts, which is the level of service and its LOS, to what the state now mandates us to follow, which is vehicle miles traveled. And so there's different ways of gauging that. And the vehicle miles traveled, um, and help me if I, if I get this wrong, mm -hmm. Rosalind, it helps uh, when there's a project, it determines how, how many trips is that uh, project going to um, create, and so then you mitigate against those against those trips. For our area, we really, if you see the map, can you pass that out. If you haven't gotten this map, um, and usually red signifies uh, a bad thing, so here it means that it's not it's in mitigable which means we can't mitigate anymore. And, and if you see this, this map, if you see this map, our area is all red. It's all red. Which means any new development will be encouraged in areas where it's yellow or green. And for me, um, and, and through our general plan update and, and the closure, and hopefully the closure of this development policy, my focus would be to, um, to focus some development uh, on the transit corridor of Capital Expressway. It's because we'll have a light rail out there, and so it'll allow for a little bit more growth. And with the closure of the airport, which by the way, when we talk about what's not appropriate for a neighborhood, that is not appropriate. The surrounding, so it was here first. It was here first. We just built around it, right? Because that's what we do. We just build around everything, <laughs> and then we say go away. Yes. Um, so, so uh, unfortunately, now there's a lot of families living around there, and um, there was a study done uh, by the health trust and by the county that found that the children living in the zip code nine five. One to two have the, uh, one of the highest lead uh, uh, blood levels of lead, and you know they have other issues that they're dealing with, right? Uh, maybe poverty, maybe high crime, and then we add on lead, um, and uh, you know we just really lessen the, the the chances for that kiddo to thrive. Um, so for me, that's one of the reasons why I am supporting the closure of Evergreen uh, of the Reed Hillview. And hopefully, you know, we can make sure that we maximize that area. So, when we close the development policy, which is going to be a good thing, because we're going to move into VMT. Even though, LO, even under a level, uh, level of service, we still can't really develop. Right, Rosalind? It, it'll cost them. Yeah. And I don't know that, uh, that they can pay enough money to, to mitigate any traffic. 
right? It's just, like I said, a subway, I'm not sure what else. Um, so we really want to go in the direction of what the state um, requires us to. And because VMT, vehicle miles traveled, will allow us to, to focus on, on Capital Expressway and the opportunities there. And so you, you have my commitment, and regardless of what you've heard, you have my commitment that there isn't going to be any housing on Evergreen College campus. Um, there, it's just not allowed, and, and it's never going to happen. Um, the, I think we have about, we have an allotment of 35, pow, 35 houses that a developer can come in and maybe infill. The developers don't like to build 35 homes, right? They want to build uh, a massive amount because that's where they make their money. Um, okay, so yes, go ahead and ask me a question. Instead of building, why don't you convert that area to parks? Which one, the Reed Hill view? No, no. Um, instead of allowing the developers to, to, to build in, you know, within yeah. certain neighborhoods, why don't you build more you know, parks for the youth? Um, actually, you know, we're one of, we are really um, lucky to have such a huge uh, district. Um, I'll tell you, uh, the District 5, which is uh, mostly the east side, the central east side, their uh, district boundary, because it's so overcrowded, we're about three times, if not more, larger than, than theirs. So we do enjoy from some beautiful open spaces and, and parks. And so I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, with good conscience say, could, do we want more parks? Absolutely. But we do have, we do have plenty uh, for our families. And I'm going to defer back to that uh, process that Rosalind outlined. This is really a process that will go through the Planning Commission, and then, uh, and of course, the Planning Department will determine whether that project is conforming, and, um, and if it isn't in terms of, of environment or any other policy um, under our general plan, they uh, get to halt it, right? Is there, is there a plan for affordable housing in the Evergreen area? No, there isn't. And, and you know, it, it's a real shame because as a school board member, when I was a school board member, Jim, you know, we lost how many? Like 500 in one year, 500 children. And then uh, consecutively we lost, I think it was maybe 400 and 300. So that means families are leaving, right? They just can't afford to be here. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have very much affordable housing. One of the very few units that we have is the senior apartments over by the villages, um, mm -hmm. uh, which allows you know the seniors to stay in in our in the district where maybe they might have grown up. So well, even they're leaving because the HOAs are ridiculous. The HOAs, I, I, I'm not sure what they're paying into <laughs> there, but but um, but that's the only place that we have a more high school. Uh, sorry, I'm against you on this. I live at the 180 position underneath. No one's tested my kids or me for less, mm -hmm. which is an evolved test. Uh, I talked to airport personnel. They have some bogus little <clears throat> CO2 or lead collector uh, where the engines run up so that they all blast into this little collector. Uh, I think they need another excuse. Uh, I'd like to see these tests. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think this isn't working anymore. Um, it may not have any more battery. No, oh, that's our signal then. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't this is the party is over. Oh, my God. Are there any plans for the Tully White Road uh, land, you know, where the cows are? The plus, 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 the Every once in a while, we'll get some developers or some consultant coming in and presenting just these fabulous plans and whatnot, you know, and I, I get to hear them and everything. Um, but first of all, it, it's not annexed into the city of San Jose. It's county land. And then second, the only way that they, they can uh, make money is to have a lot of residential, especially single detached homes. Like I said uh, earlier, we're just not meant to grow that way. 
And so, you know, uh, respectfully listen to their proposal, but I very gently say that will never happen. It just can't. It can't. So the way our development policy is right now, it restricts that. <laughs> and last, last question. Will your office have any At one uh, point. meetings or discussions on re field you know, for? Um, I will work uh, with the county. The county is really the, the lead in, in that project. We have pulled in our city manager and our city manager office uh, to make sure that they have the latest and that they have a, a bit of a, a work group. Um, and that way we can support whatever path that ends up going. Okay, at, question. at one point they were planning to expand Lake Cunningham Park into the area where the cows are. Is that still? Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah I know that I, I, there hasn't been any proposal for that, um, for that and uh, the owner wants to get the most money out of that land, and the way that he's going to get the most money is if he, right, so it's not, yeah, he's not going to do a part. Okay, well, thank you very much, thank you. and thank you for your service. Yeah, update, 2040 update. Bonnie and I are on that. I am very concerned about opening up the Evergreen Development Policy, and um, I will be keeping my eye on that very closely because the fact is, is if they build light rail down Catholic Crestwood, they're taking away a carpool lane. So it is going to be significantly more difficult to get onto 680 um, from Tully all the way out that way, right? So even though it's going to the BMT, one of the reasons why they're opening up the Evergreen Development Policy because there's so much pressure that they ran out of allocations. So they're trying to find out ways to placate development as well as try to keep the environmental impact low. But the fact is that it, it does open it up. So keeping a very close eye on the every development policy is really, really important. Actually, Jim, I'd like to correct that. I don't think that's a, a fair representation. Um, so the light rail uh, VTA project is held by the VTA, and it's not the city's attempt to do anything other than finish what uh, what was promised to our residents. We pay taxes um, to have a build out of the light rail in other places of our city, um, and we deserve to also have um, that access to light rail and be able to maybe move it into public transportation. Uh, start here in Evergreen and end up all the way to San Francisco. I'm not trying to suggest the city try anything. I'm just saying that the result is going to be the reduction of one lane in each direction. But that doesn't matter, but that is not, um, that is not uh, dependent on the BNC or the development policy. No, that's so that Those plans are, are completely separate. And if you want to oppose them or you want to uh, contribute to those, then I would say, you know, please attend one of the people for me, but it is not interdependent. It just isn't. Okay, we're out of time.